The scripture reading for today comes from Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over his number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are, our, are thy ways, thou King of kings. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked and beheld the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Revelation chapter 15. Just want to review just a little bit, see where we're at. Uh, as you can see, we this is Pentecost. This is where the Christ uh, died upon the cross and he resurrected again from the grave. And this age that we live in right now is called the church age. Okay, it's the church age. We are right here. I believe we're right here next to this arrow going up called the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I believe we're closer now than we ever have been before. And I told you before that nobody, uh, whether they be Christian or non-Christian today, nobody has a problem thinking and believing that there could be a one world government and there could be a one world leader. There's nobody that would not think that. And if you do not think that, you got some problems. You've had your head in the sand for too long. Because we can see that, that that would come by and, and that could happen really quick. Well, the rapture of the church will occur. And when the rapture of the church occurs, there's seven years. That's three and a half plus three and a half. Seven years of tribulation period. We've broken this down. The first three and a half years, you'll see the seven seal judgments. You'll see the two witnesses preach. They'll preach right there in Jerusalem. And you'll see the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. They are virgins and they are men. And they're not involved in a cult. Okay? So there's 144,000 of them. 12,000 out of 12 tribes. You do the math. 144,000. These uh, fellows will preach the gospel everywhere. They will be one of the first that will be born again after the rapture occurs. Remember, when the rapture occurs, all of those, all of those that have heard the gospel like you will have heard today and receive not Christ, reject Christ and say, no, I don't want that. All of those after the rapture, they will not believe during that tribulation period. They will all die and they will all go to hell. And that's based on God's word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe it's verse 9. It says that they will believe the lie. You say, no, that's not going to happen. My friend, you're already believing the lie now. It will happen. Because the greatest deceiver in all of the universe is Satan himself. He will deceive you. By what? By his antichrist and by his false prophet and that will occur you see that in these seal judgment then you have three and a half years of seven trumpet judgments seven vile or bold judgments the kings join antichrist for one last campaign or battle of armageddon and we saw that last week where that happens at mount megiddo and we saw that plain that is there. And it's one of the greatest battlefields ever known to mankind on the earth. And many, many that have battled there have said that. And that's where that great battle will take uh, place. And then you'll have the second coming of Christ. This will occur right here. 
And the second coming of Christ is Jesus Christ coming and putting his feet on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14. He will place his feet down. Now the rapture of the church, he will not put his feet down on the earth. We will meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And you know who that is. That's Christians that will do that. Remember, there's three strands of people. Real quick, you ought to know this. There's the first Gentiles. That's Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 12 to Acts chapter 1, or to Acts chapter 2, you have Gentiles and Jews. Then in Acts chapter 2 to Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, you have Gentile, Jew, which aren't born again, and then you have Christians, which are born again, Gentile, or Jew. If you aren't a Gentile, you're a Jew. If you aren't a Jew, you're a Gentile. That's easy to remember. So just do the history and just look through the Bible and you see those are the three people. There's only two that are left that goes through the tribulation period that is lost Gentile and lost Jew. And the, a lot of those people will have never heard the gospel. Never, bless you. They'll never hear the, they've never heard the gospel. So it's not like they've rejected the gospel. They just don't know about it. But they will have an opportunity to receive. And those that have the opportunity to receive, the vast majority of them will be martyred. They'll be killed. Okay? The first Jewish people that believe in him are the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that go and preach the gospel everywhere. And we saw that. Okay? So we're coming to chapter 15, and we're in this area right here is where we're at in chapter 15. We're almost to the second coming of Christ. But we have to deal with that. What we talked about last week was Babylon. First mentioned, Babylon was first mentioned in chapter 14. In chapter 16 and 17, Babylon is really laid out to what is Babylon. Babylon will be the city, it will be uh, the, uh, the government, and it will be the religious, and as well as the um, uh, political uh, uh, site uh, for the Antichrist and Satan himself. Okay? So remember, Satan always, always, always tries his best to look like God. That's what he does. That's all he knows. And so he's trying his best. And we saw the week before last, we saw that he got kicked out of where? You remember? He got kicked out of heaven. Thank you. And now where is he at? He's here on earth. And going to do his work that hasn't happened yet he still got access to heaven he still got access but he will fight Michael and Archangel and he will be defeated he'll be kicked out of heaven so all he has left is what all he has left is here and that last three and a half years is what they call the Great Tribulation, is what Jesus Christ specifically calls the Great Tribulation. That first three and a half years, you can put this on your sheet as you take notes, you can call it the beginning of sorrows. That's what it's called. The beginning of sorrows. And then the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years. Now I know I just gave you a boatload. So if you've been here for like 14 weeks, you're fine. You understand what I'm saying and you, like, you follow along. If you're not, then you're like, what in the world are you talking about? It's all right in Scripture. It's all right there. And God wants you to know what's coming. Because why? He has always, always, always told you and me what to do and what's going to come if we don't do it. There's no greater gentleman that I know of in all of the universe than the Lord Jesus Christ. He keeps his word and he tells you exactly what's coming. And it's left up to you and me to either receive or reject. We can say, yeah, I believe you and I'm going to do that. Or no, I'm not going to do that. Understand, either way, consequences come. They will be coming. And so where we're at now in the book of Revelation is he's had enough. He's drawing the line and saying, hey, you've heard it said payday's coming. It is coming. 
And so it will come. And I want you to know, from the very get-go, if you are a believer, you don't have to stress. We saw the assurances last uh, time. There's seven assurances that he gives in Revelation chapter 14. And he says time and time and time and time again, I'm going to do what I said, but you don't have to worry. Because you will be protected because why? Because I said so. He's always a man of his word. So understand that as we get into this. Revelation reveals that there is to be a terrible time coming upon the earth in the end time, a time so terrible that Christ himself described it as the great tribulation. Revelation uses some descriptive language to describe this period of time. It's called the judgments of the period, trumpet judgments, picturing the blast of trumpets. And there has been seven trumpet judgments altogether. But when the seventh trumpet blasted, an amazing thing happened in the seventh trumpet. There was no blast of judgment, not immediately. You see, instead, an overall picture of the end time was blown forth. What did it look like? There was a picture of Israel being chosen as a nation through which God would send his son into the world, the picture of Christ coming to the earth as a savior. We saw that in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Then we saw in Revelation 12, 6, through the rest of chapter 12, there was a picture of the dragon. You remember the old serpent who is called the devil and Satan working to get men to be ungodly and evil, all because he wants to cut and hurt the very heart of God. That's what he wants to do. Revelation chapter 13, there was the picture of the Antichrist and his right-hand man called the false prophet. And they set up shop. And they're kind at the very beginning. See, they're kind right here. They're okay if you go back. They're kind in the very th first three and a half years. They're okay. Everybody's getting along. We got rid of those stupid Christians. And man, pray. That's great. We got those people out of the way. Now we can do what we want to do. And he says, hey, I don't care who you, uh, wanna, uh, who you want to worship or the way you want to do it. Whatever you want to do, you go right ahead. And he gets everybody together. Who wouldn't want a one world governed leader like that? Everybody would. They say, hey, sign me up. Sign me up. My right hand, my forehead, hey, I'll take the sign. 20 years ago, we'd say, you can't be out of your right, you, you can't be in your right mind to believe that. Today, you go to your local mall, you say, yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. Somebody to get a mark in their head or on their forehead. That wouldn't be a problem at all. Because why? Because you see it. Why? Because we're being conditioned that way. You and I are being conditioned that way. And if you don't see that, hello, you need to wake up. Because you're being conditioned that way. Because why? Because I'll tell you why. God said it would happen. And because he said it would happen, it will happen. You can put all your money and chips in on that because it will happen. So what's he say here? In chapter 13, chapter 14, there was the glorious picture of the very end of the world. When Jesus Christ, uh, he would triumph over all the ungodly and evil of this world. The picture of Christ harvesting the earth, you remember? We saw that last week. He harvests the grain. Are you a wheat or a what? Tear. And those of you who are here know exactly what that means. Are you a wheat or are you a tear? He said what? Let them grow. Because when I come, I'll cut it down. And he said, I can tell you what's the wheat and what's the, what's the tear is. He also made the judgment looking at the ungodly. And he said, hey, there's some grapes that are going to be fiercely smashed. Remember we looked at the wine press? Remember I told you you'd remember the wine press by I Love Lucy? Because she's the one that you remember in those. Hey, all of you grin because you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's a wine press. And we said this, his wrath is full. And he's going to smash every bit of his wrath out on mankind and the world. And you say, are you kidding me? You remember what I said? I said, let's put it this way. What if it was your child? 
your son, your daughter, who you gave to the entire universe so they can have eternal life. And they said no, and they rebelled against him. And he never did one thing wrong. Now stay with me. Where would your wrath, what level would you have? Let me tell you, if you don't give the maximum, then you aren't holy. If you say, hey, let's just let it slide. Are you kidding me? Really? Then what about your holiness? You just threw that out. God's been gracious and long-suffering for a long time. Now take it down to your own life. How about in your life this week? How long-suffering and gracious he's been toward you and towards me in our actions. Not only what we do on the outside, because man can see that, but God knows why you do it. He not only knows your means, he knows our motive. That's a different story, isn't it? But that's the great God that we serve. He's not only loving, He's totally just. He's perfect in every way. And he ought to be worshipped. And so we come here and we get uh, here and remember the whole tribulation period will last just seven years. It'll be just seven years. We don't know. We don't know when this will occur. This can happen at any moment. At any moment. But you can be assured you'll know when this will happen. Because when this occurs, it'll be seven years afterwards. It'll be seven years afterwards. Satan already knows that. The believer already knows that. You say things, and I see things that are going on in our culture today. We ought to be ready. I can't believe he hasn't come back yet. It's been a long time since uh, I've been in the same service with Kurt and Danielle. And you don't know who Kurt and Danielle is. But they're here amongst us. They're from Cincinnati. I can't believe he hadn't come back. I'd have never dreamed we'd have been here today. Back then I wouldn't have dreamed this. It's amazing that he hasn't come back. Why? Because he's long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Don't ever tell me and don't ever look at God and say, Hey, you know what? You don't love me and you don't care about me. No one's ever loved you, sir. No one's ever loved you, ma'am, more than God has. No one's come close. And he's totally fair and he's totally just in everything that he does. Now remember, it's the wrath of God. And what we say, it's not the wrath of Satan. Satan is subservient. He is under God. God's always been in control. He's in control here. He's in control now. He was in control yesterday. He'll be in control forever. He's never out of control. So he's in control, and he's using these circumstances and these things to fulfill his wrath. And that's what's going to come to us. The chronological movement of the apocalypse is soon to be carried forward. Another giant step in the outpouring of what? Of the vile judgments or the bold judgments. The vile or bold judgments. But before describing that dreadful happening, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gives us one more glimpse of heaven. So I want you to notice with me this morning, the heavenly preparations for God's wrath. The heavenly preparations for God's wrath. Number one, the period of waiting. 
the period of waiting. And secondly, will be the place of worship. Okay, just two points. Number one, the period of waiting. God is in no hurry to proceed. You say, yeah, I got that because he's not in a hurry to do anything that I want him to do. All right. It kind of slow. It's just like, whoa, man, it just doesn't happen. I keep praying. I keep praying. It's not happening. He's long suffering. He's patient. He's watch. He's perfect. He's perfect. Unlike you and me, we like to run ahead of him. We like to take on and, and say, man, look. And we turn around and, man, we've got like Armageddon's already happened. We've already did all this stuff. And we say, look what I've done. And he's like, look what the mess you've made. If you just walk beside me, we wouldn't have this mess. But what do we do? In our pride, we want to do what we want to do. We tend to run ahead. Now, I know you'd never do that, but I do. Okay, that's me. I know you'd never, because you're patient as Job, I know. But I, I have a problem with that. And it's a sin problem. So it's not good. So we need to be patient and allow him to do what he wants to do with us. Because he owns us. So things are ever proceed according to his timetable and not man's. With calm, majestic poise, he invites us to, first of all, look at the scene. Look at the scene. Notice the scene. We are talking in Sunday school this morning. So many people go through life and they don't look. They just like, just go through and doing their own thing and not looking, paying attention at all. Look at the scene that he gives us. Verse 1 and 2 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. The word filled up there means it completely comes to pass. Everything that he said will happen. Okay, there's nothing that he cuts corners on. Everything that he says will happen. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that got into the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. We all saw that in chapter 13 of Revelation. Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Think about this. There it shimmers. In the light that streams out from the throne of God with currents of fire glowing in its crystal depths, the sea of glass. There they stand, a glorious throng, those who have triumphed over the beast and all that for which he stands. And the scene in heaven strikes reverence in the human heart. The scene in heaven is said to be a sign. And this is an awesome sign is intended to stir people to what? To bow before God who is just. God is love, but God is also just. And his justice is ready to be executed upon the earth. And his wrath against all the ungodly and evil upon this earth is ready to fall. God is ready to clean up the earth and to bring the reign of godliness and righteousness, love and peace, as well as peace and glory. Therefore, man must prepare himself by what? By repenting. The question is, have you done that? Have you about faced and said, you know what? I was wrong, and you're right, and I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? There has to be a moment in your life, not that you've just thought about it, but you've actually done it. We can say a lot of words, but is it fleshed out in your life? And is there enough evidence against you in the court of law to say they're guilty of being a born-again Christian? We have to repent. Now comes a sight, indeed, in slow, solemn parade, stately as the stars, think about it, appears 
seven messengers of God, the angels with the last seven plagues. And we're invited to look at the scene. But this is what I really like. We're invited to listen to the song. I love music. We're invited to listen to the song, and man, what a song it will be. Verse 3 says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. It's a twofold song the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. I wrote, I put this down, this quote, because I wanted to read this. I thought it was so good. Listen, this is what John Phillips uh, says. Uh, he compares and contrasts the two songs. Quote, the song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea. The song of the Lamb is sung at the Crystal Sea. The song of Moses was a song of triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb is a song of triumph over Babylon. The song of Moses told how God brought his people out. The song of the Lamb tells how God brings his people in. The song of Moses was the first song in Scripture. The song of the Lamb is the last. The song of Moses commemorate the execution of the foe, the expectation of the saints, and the exaltation of the Lord. The song of the Lamb deals with the same three themes. The song of Moses was sung by redeemed people. The song of the Lamb is sung by raptured people. The song is in two parts. What are they? Well, first of all, what the ransomed will sing. What the ransomed will sing. What will they sing? He says, read what he says. They will sing, first of all, how great thou art. Oh, not the song you're thinking, which is a great song. But they'll sing how great thou art. Why? They say, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Can you think about not only the works that God has done that we read in the Bible, but the marvelous works that he's done in your life for you? Do you ever just sit and contemplate and meditate and think about what he has done in your life? And some, no doubt, are looking at me and saying, well, I don't know of anything he's done in my life. Are you seriously that dead? Each time you breathe in, breathe out, that's not you. That's him. We figured out how to charge people for water. We've done a good job with that. We just haven't figured out yet how to charge people for air. And both are free. Given to you by God. How great thou art. Oh, the next thing he says is how good thou art. He's good. What's the text say? Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Thou king of saints. You ever done what is right? And some up kind of come to you and say, oh, you just act like a little saint. And you say, man, I don't like that. I absolutely love it. Because why? Because that's who I am. And that's who you are if you're in Christ. If you ain't in Christ, you isn't a saint. And that's not a good place to be. Because without Christ, you don't get into where he lives. You've got to be in the family of God. 
And if you're not in the family of God, you're in the family of, watch this, the devil. It's one or the other. It's not, I'm in my own family. If you're in your own family, you're in the family of the devil. Because he's deceived you and you're blinded by your own sin. And God doesn't want that for you. God never has wanted that for you. In fact, do you realize the lake of fire, hell, is never meant for mankind? It was meant for the devil and his angels, the ones that followed him. That's who it's meant for. But mankind, in ignorance and rebellion, says, that's where I want to go. And I don't want to get uh, to receive what you've given me. I'm going to do it myself. And God says, have your own way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but then thereof is the ways of death. Twice that's said in the book of Proverbs. I just want you to think about this. As we come to this passage, and it's like a little respite, we just kind of, okay, let's get a little respite here. Because all of these things in chapter 16, they're going to be boom, 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 boom. It's going to be one judgment after another judgment after another judgment after another judgment. And it will be, watch this, complete. You remember the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments? A third died. A third died. A third was dead. A third, not anymore. As we'll read in chapter 16 and beyond, it's done, it's done, it's done, it's done, it's done. He's not messing around. And he's been telling us over and over and over again, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. Are you ready? I get ready when I'm ready. He's coming back. Are you ready? It'll be a great song. It'll be a good song. It'll also, it'll be a glorious. How glorious thou art. Look at that last part. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? He is the one that we should give the most honor to by far. Because of who he is. Not only what the ransom will sing, but also why the remnant will sing. Why will they sing? He says what they'll sing, but why? They sing because, first of all, the majestic virtue of God. They say, thou only art holy. Do you know of anyone else that's holy? I don't know of anyone else that's holy. Thou art alone. You, God, are holy. First Peter 1 says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God tells us, You ought to be holy. Let me live through you, and you can live a holy life. He says, Because that's who I am. I'm holy. Also, not only his majestic virtue, but the magnificent victory of God. That next part says, For all nations shall come and worship before thee. All nations. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single person will. You say, I will not. Let me tell you, you may never hear, but you will. You will. Mark it down. Why? Because he said, and what he says is never wrong, and what he says will always come to pass. So you can just say, hey, you know what? I ought to just bow my knee now and do that now. Instead of thinking that I know better than he does. Do you really know better than your creator? It's laughable. It's an impossibility. He loves you. He loves me. 
So we see his majestic virtue. We see his magnificent victory. And I like this, the manifest vengeance of God. That last part there. For thy judgments are made manifest. The word manifest is made clear. Totally clear. That's the song. We're only given the barest outline of it. Each line could be expanded into a whole book. It commemorates in heaven the triumph soon to be enacted on earth, a triumph as complete and guaranteed as heaven is itself. It will occur. That's something you ought to be happy about. As a believer, you ought to be thrilled. Those in heaven that are under the altar, they're saying, How long? How long? How long are we going to wait? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And now it's like, yes! I don't know about you, that's the way I would be. I'd be all right, great, man, it's about time, it's great. Because why? Because he's holy. And he's worthy. And he's going to do what he said he's going to do. You can trust him. You don't have to trust me. I wouldn't trust me. I'm a sinner. He's perfect. And you can totally trust what he says. Secondly, let's move. The place of worship. You have a period of waiting, but he says the place of worship. This is good. The place of worship. We are now taken into the Holy of Holies in the heavens and given a description of divine splendor. You've got to think of where this is at. Even God's wrath ministers to His glory. Three things are associated with the Holy of Holies, the central place of worship in the universe. First of all, the messengers of wrath. The messengers of wrath. Verse 5 and 6, John says this, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. You say, what in the world are you talking about? They emerged from the inner sanctuary of the temple. Watch this. They do not act with impatience or in a spirit of independence like we can be known to do. But in strict accord with what? With the will of God. They come out from His presence to face a world that has reached the climax of its wickedness. A wickedness made all worse by sordid contrast with the heavenly temple's holiest shrine. They are characterized by what? Well, by divine righteousness. They are arrayed in pure, fine, white linen. What they are about to do is terrible. But it is absolutely righteous. It's right. No stain nor spot of sin is mingled with their acts. Not only divine righteousness, but also they're characterized by divine restraints. For they are girdled across the breast with golden girdles. No hot passion of their own is mingled with their acts. They are calm and they're dispassionate in what they do. The surgeon who plunges his knife into quivering flesh does so without passion. False pity does not hold him back from what he knows must be done. Surgery at times is needful, it's urgent, and in the end, healing, even though the process may seem drastic, it seems painful, and it also seems totally unkind. But it's what must 
be done. The messengers of wrath. Secondly, the mediators of wrath. The mediators. John says in verse 7, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. These mediators are the four living creatures, one of whom acts here for them all. We've seen them before. Okay? <laughs> I don't want you to think, well, I've never heard this. These four are found in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. These living creatures are the cherubim ever associated in the Scripture with God's creative and redemptive rights over the earth. Their faces are those of the lion, the calf, a man, and a flying eagle. We saw this in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Does that sound familiar? It's what we just read here in this chapter where they're at. And in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Since the whole creation groans and travails, it is fitting that these representative beings mediate the short, very sharp pains that will result in the final removal of the curse here on earth. And it will happen quick. We're not told which one handed the ominous vials to the angels of doom. I think it's the man. It's the one with the face of a man. And the only reason I believe that, man has been the chief cause of the curse. And since creation's redemption is intertwined with his, with mankind. What are you saying, Pastor? Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 21. You read these words. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Of God. All creation is pictured as living and waiting expectantly for the day when the sons of God shall be glorified. The words there that you see, earnest expectation, it means to watch with the neck outstretched and the head erect. It is a persistent, unswerving expectation, an expectation that does not give up but keeps looking until the event happens. It's waiting. Lastly, the manifestation of wrath. Verse 8. You have the messengers. You have the mediators. And now you literally have the manifestation of wrath. Verse 8 says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And watch this, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. You see, the awesome Shekinah glory fire resided within the Holy of Holies in Israel's temple. And you remember, once a year, a priest was permitted to enter there carrying a bowl of blood in his hand. And since Calvary... The way into the holiest in heaven has been open to all because why? Because the blood of Christ has blazed a highway to the heart of God. If it wasn't for the blood of Christ, there would be no hope for mankind. But now for a brief spell, that royal highway is stopped. Think about this. And no man is able to enter into the temple. God's wrath, once poured out upon his son on man's behalf, is to be outpoured again. Do 
the world that crucified the lamb and that now has crowned its rebellions with the worship of the beast is to be judged to the full. So bright glory burns within the temple, filling it with smoke and standing guard at the door. The way into the holiest is barred again for a while. It's interesting that the temple, look at verse 5, is open. The door is open. Man was able to enter the temple. No man. In verse 5, it was opened. But in verse 8, it's closed. God is telling you and me, there is a time coming when this occurs that you will not be able to enter. He's done. He's, watch the words, you know it well, he's had enough. He's had enough. And now, he's going to judge the world. I know what I've said this morning is not popular in America. I'm fully aware of that. It's not popular anywhere. But it's exactly what God says. To my knowledge, I've not said one word this morning that's not backed up by Scripture. And you may be really sensitive right now and just say, man, I hate you. I don't like what you're saying at all. And I don't blame you. But I tell you this, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And only the truth which is found in Christ, the very Son of God, will set you free. I love you enough to tell you. You don't have to go through all of this stuff. You don't. But it's left up to you whether you do or not. Every single human being, as we learned last week, will hear the gospel preached. Every single human being will hear the gospel preached. God is thorough in what he does. And he loves you and me. He doesn't hate his creation. He loves us. You and I are made in his image. So when we disobey him and we say no to him and say, I don't want to do that. We're sticking our finger in his nose and saying, get out of here. I don't care about you. And when I say that, you naturally would say, that's totally ridiculous. Who in their right mind is going to be that stupid and do that? As Nathan told David... Thou art the man. Thou art the woman. We're all guilty of that. But the good news is, you can receive him, and he wipes that away. And the ones that sit there and go like this, every one of you understand, yeah, he did that in my life. Whew. Thank you, Lord. And if he hasn't done that in your life, it's not that he can't. He's the total gentleman. He never comes to you and me like this. He always comes like this. For whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. It's the most liberal statement in the universe. Don't care what you've done. Come. And you ask me, and he says, I can save you. I'd be more than happy to. But you must come. 
what we say? You got to confess your mess. You got to fess up. I'm wrong. You're right. And I need you. I need you more than anything else. He said, I know. And I'm right here. He's the only one that can change your life. Don't walk to him. Run to him. And don't go another moment without him. Makes no sense. So I encourage you. Know him. He's done everything possible for us. And what is so gracious is he even points out in this book, this is what's coming. You don't have to be a part of this. But I just want you to know, this is what's coming. So I encourage you, get into the family of God. Can you imagine Noah, his three sons and their wives, as the water came down and hearing people outside begging, please let me in. I know, Noah. I know. I know what I said to you. I'm so sorry. Let me in. Let me in. If there's any humanity at all, no doubt he's standing there and going, how can I let him in? But we remember who shut the door. God shut the door. And no man was able to enter into the temple. Who's going to shut the door again? God's going to shut the door again. We saw what happened to those in Noah's day. They all lost their life to spend eternity in a place not made for them, but for the devil and his angels. Why would anyone choose that over a life and eternity with God? I encourage you, make sure you know him and you're in the family of God.